flies. <laughs> <laughs> then we saw it with us laughing. <laughs> it was good. Uh, yeah. yeah. Hi, everyone. Very happy to introduce Wayne Kelly. Uh, start us off with an intro to you and your books, Wayne. Well, first of all, thanks for having me. I really, really appreciate it. It's great uh, to be on. Um, yeah, so I'm uh, Wayne Kelly, or W.A. Kelly as I write, uh, my pen name. And uh, my debut crime novel is uh, Safe Hands. And uh, a lot of people, a lot of authors, I've got a podcast, so I know a lot of authors struggle to ex explain the book. So if it's okay, I'll just read the blurb if that's all right. Okay. Uh, so uh, it's uh, a retired safe cracker. Uh, Mickey Blake was the best, able to open any safe with only his heightened sense of touch. And for the last 18 years, he's been retired, hiding out in Spain and trying to save his marriage. But now his wife's dying. He owes money to the wrong people and time is running out. And then you've got a desperate mother, which is uh, she's living in a rundown seaside town. And that's Hazel. She's a single mum driven to kill to avenge her friend and stop her teenage son being sucked into a life of crime. And it's essentially one last job for Mickey. Mickey meets Hazel when he returns to the UK for one last job to sunny Skegness and people that are from the Midlands will probably be familiar with where that is, a uh, rundown seaside town, to open a huge vault inside a gangland casino. Before that, he needs to deal with a dead body, a corrupt undercover cop, an unhinged crime boss, and a son that hates his guts. And the question is, can Mickey and Hazel get out clean? So, yeah, so that's safe hands, and that's me. Brilliant. Now, I have never set foot in Skegness. Right. Do you feel um, – you've read the book, haven't you, Nakaz? So do you feel like you've stepped in it now? <laughs> well, yes and no. I mean, I am, I'm actually from Lincolnshire, so I, I think it's even worse that I've not set foot in Skegness. That's but really surprising, have, yeah. Never been – um, but I've heard about it. It's one of those kind of legendary towns. <laughs> yeah, well, I have to, if there's anybody watching and they're from Skegness, I have to counter this. It does, seems like I'm really down on Skegness in the book. I'd have to say I'm not down in the you know, down on Skegness. One of my characters is, and it's his frame of mind that he goes in. Uh, but yeah, Skegness is kind of like, if you live where I live in the Midlands, I live in Leicester, it's kind of like the closest sort of seaside -y type town um and it's where a lot of working class people myself included went when i was a kid so you've got you know donkey rides and donuts and all that sort of stuff was what it was when i was growing up and it's changed a bit now and they've got it's actually much better than it was when i was younger to be honest there's a decent fairground and that sort of thing uh but yeah it's a bit uh it's cheap and cheerful and it's a bit it's got that chavtastic vibe um which uh, kind of made it interesting, an interesting place for my character to revisit. He'd been there when he was a little kid and now he's coming back to experience it. And as I say, he's not really, he's coming from Spain and he doesn't really want to come back to the UK at all. And he's coming back to this, this rundown seaside town from his uh, childhood days. So it feels like he's gone full circle. Yeah. And I mean, coming back from Spain to the UK <laughs> is probably not your best. Like it's always a drag, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what made you start him off in Spain? So, yeah, so ba basically it, before the book started, he's kind of done this one last big job. And so it's one of those things where everybody sort of knows that he did it because there's only really one person that could have done it that's got the skills that he's got, which I can talk about a little bit later. He's very got this very specific skill that he's got. He's a safe cracker, but there's a little bit more to it than that. Um so sort of a lot of people suspected him having done it, but he wanted to make sure that he didn't get arrested or anything. So as soon as he got it, it was a very, very big job. And he took the money and he ran and he thought he was just going to be able to settle down in the sunshine and live a normal life. He starts a bit of a business over there. Um, but obviously there's no NHS there. His wife doesn't want to come back for other reasons, which kind of go into in the book. And so he ends up sort of trapped there. When she gets seriously ill, she's got cancer. So when she gets seriously ill, uh, it's difficult and he needs to raise some money fast. Um, and there's there's other things going on as well. And there's some bad elements that kind of want more money than he's got so that they call the debt in. And he uh, he's forced to take this job against his better judgment. And obviously when he comes back, he finds out there's even more to it. So there's not, it's not everything is not as it seems when he first comes back. No, I think I described it as Ocean's Eleven meets Skegness. 
<laughs> yeah, I like that. It's good. Yeah, <laughs> it's my take. I mean, I'm a big fan of. Uh, I, I mean, I love I love British crime f fiction, obviously. But one of the, my big influences, I would say, is American crime fiction, and I love Dennis Lehane and George Pelicanos and people like that. And I wanted to kind of do sort of my take on it, which is very British, lots of dry humour. Everything is a little bit crusty and faded. You know, it's not Las Vegas, as you say, it's Skeg Vegas. Um, and uh, that's the vibe that I wanted to give it. And I kind of wanted to revisit some of my things with my childhood and things I remember from, uh, you know, going to working class, uh, sorry, working men's clubs and all that sort of thing. And that's the that's the era that I kind of wanted to conjure up and uh, that, that Mickey's kind of going through. This, um, so tell us a little bit more about his safe cracking expertise. Yeah, so Mickey has got, he, when people think of safe cracking, uh, they often think, they either think two things. They think somebody just blows up the safe with, you know, they put a few sticks of dynamite on it, or there's this old fashioned thing of somebody with a stethoscope listening in, you know, that you get from sort of old films or whatever to crack it. What Mickey can do is he's got a really, really heightened sense of touch. And this kind of sounds uh, sort of supernatural or something, but it's not. It is an actual thing that some people can do. And he can lay his hands onto the safe and he can manipulate the dial of the safe. And in doing so, he can feel what's going on there and he can find a, kind of find the combination. He got this very, very heightened sense of touch. And there is, I was, th that side of it, I was actually inspired by an actual person, which is, I'm not, I'm not, still not convinced this is his real name, but he goes by Jeff Sitar and he's an American. And at one time he was the world champion safe cracker, which, you know, who knew there was even a competition in world championship safe cracking. Um, but you can Google him and you can find him on YouTube um and he's got this particular skill and they test it they put things like a feather in the mechanism and he can feel which number it's on and all these sort of things again it kind of has to be sort of seen to be believed so i was really intrigued by this and it kind of set me off on a, a different tack with mickey the way that he experiences the world is very much through sense of touch so his memories are triggered by a sense of touch he'll touch something and he'll he'll reminisce about something rather than like a lot of us with smell or something like that um and so i just i just thought it was it made him a much more interesting character this is kind of how he experiences the world on one hand he's really really sensitive with his fingertips and in other ways as you've probably realized if you read the book is he's he's actually really insensitive in lots of other ways so i like the kind of contrast between the two things yeah i think that's a really good summary of him <laughs> Yeah, he's definitely not the. Um, I mean, I'm trying to think of the way to describe him without being rude. He's not like the most likable fella, is he? No, especially at the beginning of the book. I mean, believe it or not, this is a really toned down version of it. When I when I originally started writing him a few years ago, and I was in, I mean, writing critique groups and things like that, and uh, I he did, really did split the room. He was really very very sexist he was very he was like something you know from days gone by and, and don't get me wrong he's still got elements of some of these things um he's kind of quite uh you know no nonsense and things but he's very 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 much softer uh than he than he was before and obviously the whole idea with it is although he's got this hard exterior and he seems like he's very you know he's a tough he's a tough man and all the rest of it he's actually got masses of baggage and he's got lots of other hang-ups and he's really, really disappointed in himself with his relationship with his son and he's trying to mend that. And so he's got lots of regrets. And the other thing to mention that I kind of haven't really mentioned that much, but he's he's an older character. He's he's 60, which isn't old, but in terms of crime fiction and criminals, you don't get that many uh, main characters of the, that are in that sort of age group. And again, I wanted to explore that. So he's not He's no longer this physical force that he might have been when he was younger. His faculties are going a little bit. He doesn't quite feel as sharp as he was. He's been out of the game for nearly 20 years. So I was really fascinated by all that stuff. I didn't want it to just be, you know, a Jack Reacher type character that just can come in and he's almost like a superhero character. I wanted the opposite of that, really. I wanted him to be fragile and kind of uh, vulnerable. It's just that at the beginning of the book, I don't think that's immediately apparent. And that's what I like. I like the idea that he kind of you know we're, hopefully people will see when they when they read the book but hopefully it goes on some kind of uh you know journey and changes from the beginning to the end of the book that's the idea anyway 
So apart from the World Championship of safe cracking, did you do any other kind of research into that world? I don't know much about it. There's a scientist who's really famous for doing a lot of like lock picking and safe cracking and things. But yeah, this uh, James Randy, I think, was one of the guys that did some of that stuff. He was a magician and he debunked a lot of people that could do some of these different bits and pieces. Um, I mean, it was tempting to go out and try to do some bank jobs, but I, I, I bottled out at the last minute. Uh, no, it was just like a lot of things with authors, really. It was just lots and lots of reading. It was lots and lots of research. And the thing with it was I wanted to, I wanted it to be based in, as I say, I didn't want it to be a supernatural thing. I want it to be an actual something that people can do, an actual skill, an actual talent. But equally, I wanted to elevate it to something else. I wanted it, as you read it, I wanted you to feel like it was almost like a superpower but the way that he experiences it i wanted to put you right in there i wanted to the way that he thinks about it and the way that a lot of people who can pick locks and things the way that they have to think about it is they have to be very they have to visualize something they can't actually see i mean if somebody picks a lock you can't actually see into a lock most of the time so you have to do it by feel and you have to sort of visualize it in your head almost like a map of inside the lock and he has to do a similar thing um with a safe so that's kind of what i wanted to do that's what i wanted to bring to the reader and most people that have read it have said to me have you cracked some safes or something in time where did you get the research to do it but it, it is like i say like a lot of things with writers is it's a lot of research but then i think it's taken it that step further with some imagination and a little bit of um uh let's say we romanticize it a little bit but just to like elevate it hopefully that's the idea to kind of make it exciting and interesting so you've you've got a podcast yeah this your first book or have you delved into like other bits of writing and things before i've done lots of writing and stuff i'm I, my day job is part of my day job is i'm a filmmaker so i've written scripts and things like that uh before as part of my job and I, i've produced documentaries and things so i've done lots of writing and i've been in critique groups for years and i've uh you know done short story competitions and all those kind of things um and i've written like most authors the, although this is my first published book it's not my first novel that i finished i've got lots that will probably stay in the drawer forever and never come out you know my learning novels if you like um so yes yeah, so i've written other things before but this was the first one that i thought actually i've got something here i was in a critique group at the time and um i was getting a lot of good feedback from this character and this story and I could sort of tell I was onto something that was a little bit different from things that I'd written before. Um, and it's the first in a series. Well, there'll be at least three books anyway. I'm on book two at the moment, but yeah, I've got ideas. I'm halfway through another standalone. It's another crime book uh, that's totally different to this, um, totally different story set of characters and everything else. Um, but sort of still tied to my low character locality because i don't think there's enough stories about where i come from um which is not particularly glamorous place but leicester and leicestershire um which obviously comes up in the book so a lot of say fans is set in skegness but we do sort of there's a little bit of a uh a sojourn to leicestershire and in the book too there'll be a lot more leicestershire as well so that was something that i wanted to do because i don't really think it's been represented that much in fiction no, you've been asked that. So, um, Katie has asked you what brought you to crime. You write about safe cracking in minute detail. Is there something you'd like to tell us? <laughs> I've, so, I've I've mentioned before, but I don't want to talk about my alter ego. I said I, I said I wouldn't uh, talk about that. So, because you know, I'll, I'll be wanted. Uh, no, it was just lots. That was just lots of research. Um, but I mean, in terms of why it was Leicester, I mean, it was quite funny because I went on to the local radio station here, Radio Leicester, and, you know, they should be really pro Leicester. And they actually asked me in an incredulous voice, why did you set it in Leicester? <laughs> but that kind of sums up how Leicester people are, really. We're a bit, uh, you know, we tend to be a bit self-effacing and, you know, that's we, we kind of don't really like to sing about our achievements. We're sort of famous for the football team and finding a dead king under a car park and, you know, we've got a few celebrities, but most most of the celebrities tend to move away. So it's uh, it's been good to talk about Leicester for a little bit. What made you choose to write a crime story? 
I read, I mostly read crime. I don't exclusively read crime, but I read a lot of crime. I'm really drawn to the genre in general. It's my favourite genre from a film point of view. All my favourite films are, are crime films, you know, The Godfather, Heat, Goodfellas, um, all these all these kind of things. So I've always been drawn to it. It's the, it's the darker side. I mean, it's the guess why you've got so many members, uh, you know, of... UK crime book club it's it's a really really popular genre for a reason I think a lot of us most of the people that I read that are into crime or write crime tend to be very very mild-mannered normal <laughs> in inverse commas people at least on the outside anyway we're good at hiding it but we do like to explore this darker side and we like to see you know what's what's going on in these darker corners of society and i think it's just a brilliant genre i think you can you can almost write about anything in crime um you know you can take any topic you can think of and put it through this 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 funnel if you like of crime and look at it in a different way they use this use this lens to look at lots of different issues um and sometimes you know you don't even realize that you can just read a book and it's just a page turning book and it's brilliant and you read it from beginning to end and you just think well that was a great story but usually there's lots of other things going on and um there's lots of layers to it and that's what i love about it isn't there a theory that we read crime and you know like get into horror and kind of true crime and stuff to sort of face up to those things that scare us you know in yeah. like way because they're the things we should be scared of but we're gonna yeah i think it's a, the same as getting onto a roller coaster i think it's the same thing i mean it feels life-threatening when you're on it and it can be terrifying but also you you know that you're going to be okay and you're going to be able to get off at the end of it and i think it's exactly the same um you know you you watch any of your favorite tv programs you usually know that the main character is probably going to come out of it at the end of it although they don't always obviously there are you know you do have surprises and stuff but you still enter into it sort of knowing that that's the case and yet you're still biting your nails through it and thinking oh are they going to make it through this time is this the time they're not going to make it and i think that's down to good writing but i think it's just because we care about these um care about these characters and one of the things i wanted to do with safe hands was i mean the, the main character is a criminal which uh you know I'm, I'm i'm setting myself a bit of a challenge right from the get-go because i want you to get behind and relate to somebody that's on the wrong side of the law it's just that he, he's a bad person but he's less bad than some of the other people in the book that's kind of how i kind of thought about it and really i like i'm attracted to stories where it's a normal person that's drawn into doing bad things for the right reasons. You know, that's, and, and we haven't talked about the other character yet in the book, but the, the female character, Hazel, and she's very much that she isn't a criminal at all. Um, and without giving too much away from obviously what's in the blurb, but she, she gets drawn into very dark set of circumstances because she's trying to protect her son. And I think we can, that's something that we can all relate to wanting to protect a family. Um, and the lengths that we'll go to and what the, the kind of uh, what can happen on the back of that there's um i get what you're saying my mind's still on the fact that i wouldn't want to get on a roller coaster but i'd have to <laughs> <find it. laughs> we're getting on to the uh, the nemesis <laughs> no, no. uh you'd never get me onto the nemesis uh <laughs> Did you, um, Katie, as I get asked, she's got loads of good questions. She said, did you have the twists in mind from the outset? I didn't. It took me, again, without giving too much away about the plot, they, they, I, I, I had to, particularly with the end of the book, it took, once I realised what was going to happen at the end of the book, uh, in terms of what Mickey was going to find at a certain point, then everything slotted into place, but it took me a long time to get there. Um, but I mean, a lot of writers will say some of the things. A lot, you get people that plot stories to the nth degree and some writers that just go off and write anything. I'm kind of in between the two things. I kind of, I go off like a rocket at the beginning, think, oh, I've got this, I've got loads of ideas and off I go. And then I write myself into really bizarre situations that I can't get out of or a little cul-de-sacs. And then I have to stop and go back and, untangle things and then carry on that's kind of how i am and i kind of constantly doing that and the difficulty i think is resisting the most obvious ideas because you know i had a really good 
writing mentor a few years ago and she always used to say if you've got a plot problem or you're trying to solve something the first five ideas at least will be the most obvious ideas so write them all down and she said she used to say write 10 down write 10 down and then discount all those 10 and then you might find the 11th the 12th and 13th is the one that you really want to try and find the least the least obvious and that's kind of how i try to work but it's, it, it does diff it is very very difficult you know there's this idea that you put your characters uh, in a tree and then throw stones at them and that's that's kind of what writers do but that's that's fine but then you've got to try and work out how you get them down from the tree at, the, at some point uh laurie has asked you she well she said first of all she was lucky to read an early copy she was yeah and she wants to know i'm guessing you know who laurie is yeah uh, she says she'd like to know who you choose to play Mickey in a movie. That is a good question. And I might I might not answer it because just because I always think this is a bit of a dangerous question, partly because I kind of had somebody in mind when I first started. And it, to be honest, even if I said the name, I should imagine 70 percent of the people watching this would be who because it's quite an old actor now. He's not even around anymore. But also, I always think you i'm giving i'm giving a reader a description in their mind that they might not want that's the other thing i've because i've done that i've said it to people before i've said things and they've gone oh no oh no that's ruined it for me that's not who i had in mind so i like the idea that i don't know whether you're the same Kaz, but when i'm reading a book i've kind of got a picture of i picture certain things in my mind and you know that's my kind of that's who i've got my image in my head based on the little bit of description that they might give me and sometimes that's not physical description they might just describe what the person's like or how they move or anything else and i kind of think about that but my version of the character is probably different to yours i'm one of those weird people who don't picture things in my head that's weird i've been reading about this phenomenon recently that must be well it's not weird to you it's all you know isn't it i suppose exactly um our favourite twist on this question, because we ask, we don't like asking that when we do mm. our interviews. Our favourite twist on that is if it was turned into an adaptation, who would you play? Oh, that's good. That is a good question. <clears throat> I would probably play... Hmm. Well, I've, there's, there's, lots of, there's lots of elements of Mickey of me in mickey but it's all the bits that are not good so it's not the expertise it's it's his sarcasm it's his use of puns sometimes uh because i love a good pun um i wouldn't if i was mickey i wouldn't be anywhere near as good at well doing anything because i'm pretty inept at most things but when he does put his foot in it and he says the wrong thing in social situations that's me so i'd suit it so if, if if mickey had like a really inept sidekick i guess i'm probably thinking about it i'm probably closer to warren than i am anybody else in the book and uh yeah because warren warren is uh yeah he's not the sharpest tool in the box and uh he's he's you know he likes to put his foot in it and do and say the wrong thing at the wrong time so that's uh, thinking about it yeah that's probably me i'd say that's who you play is it you're not very <laughs> nice to yourself though <laughs> uh yeah i think that's i think that'd be most i think most people that actually know me would agree yeah that's probably closest the most inept character in the book was pro is probably closest to me that's why we write we write these other characters so that we can you know we can role play actually being good at stuff. That's why we do it. You've been asked um, who your favorite author is, that's Sarah. My favorite author, oh, I haven't, I wouldn't say I've got, I, it's a mood yeah. thing. My favorite author at the minute, and I just, you know, like me and everybody else, I suppose, or a lot of other people in the country at the minute because of Slow Horses is Mick Heron. Um, I really, really like the Slow Horses uh series but i also like his standalone books that he's written i love the tv series and i was blown away when i first like a lot of people probably but when i first watched the first episode of uh slow horses i just i couldn't believe how accurate an adaptation it was or just how just everything about it it's kind of it, they just caught the humor of it the locations that they got seem to perfectly match what's written in the book and the characterization and gary oldman's character and all the rest of it um so mick heron's probably my, my current favorite british author and the 
and authors that I go back to that I've read a lot of, as I say, I'm a really, really big fan of Dennis Lehane, um, George Pelicanos, um, S.A. Cosby is a, is a, I really like his books. Um, obviously he's relatively new on the scene and this probably again, another person that I've read all of his stuff is Ian Rankin. Obviously but everybody says that probably cause he's, because he's kind of a legend in the scene, but, um, I love Rebus, um, and I'm a big Ian Rank Rankin fan. And Laurie said she's loved the funds. She, what's that? Sorry. Laurie said she loved the funds. The puns. <laughs> and that you've been writing and detailing it on your podcast. What's the biggest thing you learned from writing the book? Um, I think the biggest thing that I've learned from writing the book is, I mean, I think the biggest thing in general, when you actually finish something and you go through all the different drafts and you actually get it out, I think the biggest thing is realizing that you can do it. I know that sounds like a silly thing to say, um, but lots of writers, especially when they've been writing for a while, they might write a novel, they might get to the end, they might type the end and then they put it in a drawer and they never touch it again and they never redraft it because they just think it's terrible and all the rest of it. And I think the thing that I learned most is that if you just keep going and you do keep working on it and you keep honing it, um, that you will, you know, you will get there in the end. Um, that That is the big thing. And I think knowing that you can do it once means you can probably do it again. Although through the podcast, I've interviewed people that have written you know, 20 books and they still tell me that they, you know, 21st book, they're still thinking, can I do it? And will, will I be able to, is this the time that it's all going to fall apart? So I'm not sure about that. We've all got imposter syndrome. I think most writers that I speak to are the same. You've always got that, uh, that little voice in your head saying, you know, you're rubbish. You can't do it. You're not, this is going to be the time that you're not gonna be able to finish your draft or whatever. So, um, I think it's that. I think it's perseverance. I think with all of this stuff, it's just keep going with it and keep learning. And the other thing with it is as well, with writing in general, is you never, ever, ever stop learning. It doesn't matter how long you've been doing it, you all, there's always something else to learn. There's always something else you can try. There's always a new technique you can find or a new way of telling a story. Um, that's why I love it. That's why I've loved it ever since I could read, to be honest. Ever since I was a little kid, I've always loved it. What got you into making a podcast? So I started the podcast in 2014, which it was actually really early to do a podcast. Like everyone's got a podcast now. <laughs> but, but at the time when I did it, it was actually quite technically it was quite difficult. There was like hoops you had to jump through to get a, an RSS feed and all this kind of stuff. And it started off because I was in a critique group and one of the other members I talked about it with and I started off co-hosting it. I host it on my own now, but I start, originally I started off co-hosting it. Um, and it was just a fun way to talk to other writers. And it's, to be honest, it still is. That is the main thing that I get out of it. I absolutely love those hour long conversations that I have with other writers. Hearing that, as I say, even incredibly successful authors that have been doing it for decades, that they've got all the same hang ups, all the same worries, all the same issues that, somebody that's been doing it a couple of years or something has got it's exactly the same um and it's like you know it's probably one of the reasons you you do this is to to talk to other like-minded people it's people that love the same things that you do they love books they love words they love writing um and there's some really really inspirational stories about how people got into writing how they got published how you know there's people that got hundreds and hundreds of rejections and they kept going and they still did it that's really really inspiring and obviously i get to pick their brains about all this stuff and you know chat to them chat to them about their challenges and how they got through it so that's that's why i love doing it and the the idea the actual idea behind the name joined up writing podcast originally was again it was another pun um you know joined up writing as in curse of writing but also joining up with people the the thing that i didn't realize when i set it up was in america joined up writing means nothing they they don't use that phrase <laughs> they don't they don't use that for cursive writing i only found that out in the last few years so that was you know that was stupid really so there's probably lots of american people just thinking there's there is no point it's just a stupid name but that, that sums me up really <laughs> do you have a favorite person that you've interviewed I don't know whether I've got a favourite. I mean, I've got, I've had some interviews that I 
that I really enjoyed. And I mean, one of my favorite guests um, that I mean, he's been on a couple of times and just because it was, it was a surprise, not he, not that he was a surprise in himself because he's a, a lovely guy and he's really entertaining, but his story and how he got into writing was really in interesting, which is Tony Schumacher, uh, who was a novelist and he's got some brilliant historical, well, alternate hi historical fiction uh, books, but now he writes for TV, he writes The Responder. I don't know whether you've seen that uh, with Martin Freeman. That's on the BBC. He plays a sort of corrupt uh, police officer set in Liverpool. Um, and Tony Schumacher writes that now, but he did write novels. When I had him on originally, he wrote novels and I chatted to him. But his story is incredible. He's 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 kind of he's older than me. He's the next kind of generation up. But he was a taxi driver um, initially, and he got you know one of the stories that he tells is about somebody getting in his cab that worked for a, a, a magazine and got chatting to him, and he just casually said, "Yeah, I I write." And she says, what do you write? And he says, I'll write short stories. Uh, I write about people that get in my cab. And she said, well, what, well, you know, what do you, what do you call it? I write for a magazine. What, what do you call it? And he said, he literally looked at her in the, in the mirror and he went rear view mirror in, in the rear view. And she went, that's a great name. And she, on the spot, she offered him a column in the magazine and that's kind of how he got started. So this, he's got loads of stories like that. So again, he's just inspiring and inspiring character. He's had loads of different jobs. It's just very, very interesting. So he's the writing, but he's got a really, really interesting life story. So that's one of my favorite episodes. Um, but I've, you know, loads of people that I've spoken to, they've been, they've been fun chats. So you were talking earlier about going back to safe hands because I've distracted you. No, that's all right. But it's just really interesting when you hear other people who do the thing of interviewing people. It's always like, I just find it really interesting to ask questions about. Um, but we'll go back to books. <laughs> <laughs> you're, you're saying you're working on book two? Yeah. Now. Uh, and that you've got a series where there's going to be at least three. Do you know your ending for the whole series? Well, I don't. I haven't got an end. I haven't got an end end as in I can't quite decide what I'm. I don't think. I mean, I don't know. Maybe I'll change my mind. I don't know whether I can be really final and properly kill all the main characters off. I don't know whether I can quite do that. Or whether I'm brave enough to do that. Um, but I can see. Uh, obviously, I'm halfway through book two at the minute. I've got an idea for book three. Uh, I've actually got another idea that could be a fourth book, but. I don't know about this thing, but I've got I have got something, an idea for book three that kind of closes the story off a little bit and kind of brings it full circle. So I don't know. I'm going to see how it is. But I, I mean, I'd really I, part of the problem is, I mean, I've got a day job as well and it's a busy day job. And part of the problem is finding the time that you want to write the books. So every time I think, oh, I'm going to write another book in the series, it's probably time I can't write another book. So I'm, I'm halfway through another standalone book, which I'd really like to go back to and finish at some point. Um, but I've kind of committed to book two coming out by the end of this year. So, and then I'm, I'm halfway through the first draft at the minute, and then that's going to need to be uh, edited and structural edits and beta readers and all the rest of it that you have to go through. So there's a lot, a lot of stuff to do in a relatively short space of time. Um, so yeah, so that's that's where I am with it really. And I think, I think it's like all of these things. I think it's how much time you want to spend with the characters, and and the other thing with it is how much time other people want to spend with the time with the characters. You know, if the book doesn't massively take off, maybe, maybe I'll fall out of love with it. You know, that's the, that's the reality of it. If people are not that interested, then, uh, you know, there's no point in me chasing after them into the sunset. What's the response been like to it so far? It's been good. Yeah, it's been really good. It's been nice for people to actually pick up on some of the things that I've not really kind of been really vocal about some of the other stuff that's in the book to do with some of the themes around uh, families and children. Um, and, the, you know, this idea about you, you, your children can't learn from your mistakes, which is apparent you know, I learned that eventually my daughter's 22 now. And after me telling her over and over again, Oh, don't do this because I did it and it didn't work out good. You know, she's got to do it herself because she's living a totally different life to me. And that was one of the things that I wanted to put in the book. Um, so there was stuff like that. I love the fact that people have connected to the locality of it. I've had 
people that are kind of local to the area that I, again, that I don't know and that I haven't met and they're all like blown away that like places like uh, Bradgate Park is in it, which is a local uh, national park that's here. And people are, I couldn't believe it. I turned the page and, I was, you know, then it was Bradgate Park. I didn't think anybody would ever write about Bradgate Park and all this kind of thing. So that's been brilliant. And uh, I, I think eventually, I think one of the big things that's kind of come up in a lot of the reviews is words to the effect of, I didn't think I was going to like this or I didn't think I was going to like this character, but, and that uh, Mickey has kind of won people over, which was the idea. I'm not interested in, I was never interested in writing just a really bland vanilla character that everybody loves from page one. I wanted to create a character that you have to work a little bit to, you know, to get on his side and see where he's coming from. Um, because I think that's a bit more interesting. All the characters that I like in books and in films, they're usually a bit grey. They're a little bit, you know, they're not what they first appear. That was my idea anyway. And he's an older guy and he's lived the life. That's the thing. He's got, he's, he's, he's flawed like we all are. Yeah, I think it makes characters more real. Mm. Well, Hopefully, yeah. Real. Yeah. And the same goes for Hazel, the other character in the book. Um, you know, she, again, is, she's not a young, you know, she's not a really, really young woman. She's a middle-aged woman, so she's she's lived the life. She's got things that have been going on in her life. She's got baggage. She's got things that she's working through. Um, and like all of us, she's just trying to make the right decisions and trying to, you know, do the right thing. Not always succeeding, obviously, because if she did that, then there wouldn't be a very interesting book. But... Um, that's the plan is that, uh, you know, these characters, hopefully they're, they're, they're relatable with people that you can relate to and think, oh, I can sort of see why that person did that or why they might think that. And I've had a similar experience. That's what I wanted to write. Like I said, I didn't really want to write like a supercharged kind of Jack Reacher type thing. Um, I wanted the characters to feel real and relatable, uh, especially, you know, I'm hoping that to a British audience, they feel like they're real relatable characters that people that they feel like they've met. And to an international audience, I hope it encourages them to kind of lean in a bit. And, you know, I mean, I English stories and British stories in general, you know, at the, at the Anglophile side of like in America with, um, you know, Downton Abbey and all these kinds of things that are massively taken off. But also a lot of English sitcoms and things are taken off now in America. So they are actually quite interested in what goes, you know, what's going on here. And I think we should lean into it rather than try to, you know, be more American and tr try and make out with something that we're not. So that's that was the idea anyway. We have quite a few American members in the group who are big fans of... That's great, yeah, yeah. Crime. I should imagine it's a similar reason as to why we write, why we read American fiction or Scandi noir or anything else. It's like it's great to actually experience another another person's culture, another person's lifestyle. You know, we're not living in that that area. We we're not used to it, so it kind of feels exotic to us. You know, like a, something that's well, sent in or wherever. But I also think, like what you were saying about people writing to you about the national park appearing and things i think there's a lot to be said for people really liking reading fiction sort of rooted in like places they know and places that you've been and and things yeah absolutely yeah and it was tempting it's like especially with skegness because I was tempted for a while. I was thinking about, oh, shall I just come up with, I'll base it on Skegness, but I won't call it Skegness. I'll just come up with a name that's a bit like Skegness and, you know, I'll just pretend sort of thing, which lots of authors do. And I get that. I see, I totally see why they do it. Um, and it avoids like any sort of blowback if you say something that's unkind about a city or a town or, or whatever. But I think there's two practical things. I spoke to an author about it Um my name escapes me off the top. Uh, no, it escapes me off the top of my head. But I talked to her about it, and she started a series. And initially, when she started a series, it was a made-up town, and she said it was a massive mistake because, for just on a practical level, it actually helped sales to have it associated with a town or a city because all the people from that area or around that thing were, oh, oh, right, oh, it's set in wherever Bradford or wherever it was. 
it's like you know they can relate to it and it actually gives you an, an audience to go to um and it just meant you know she could actually just go to go you know i can it's like with skegness i've been there lots of times and that part of the time when i was writing the book my daughter was at dance competitions at skegness butlins and so i had a couple of like weekends there and i just went off walking and with my camera and i took lots and lots of pictures so i got to go around and experience it but when you can't do that we've got google earth now so you know i can wander the streets <laughs> uh digitally and go oh that's interesting oh i'll have it and you can thought when you when you're planning out a scene or whatever you can sort of have people walk in roughly in the right direction although if anyone's reading my book don't you know don't be too hard on me on there i'm sure i've taken some liberties in some places there is also um have you ever read heidi goody and ian grant because they um they have some books set in skegness and oh right now no i didn't know that right right oh i should check those out then are they yeah. a bit more um a complimentary to skegness than i am or i think they're quite comedic right i think i do think the place lends itself to that um i do think it's got that element i just i don't i don't see it as like like i say i'm not like slagging the place off i think it's more like it's it is a it's a it is a little bit run down in places but like most seaside towns in britain are nowadays they're not obviously lots of people they're not using them in the same way that they were using them before and they've not got as much money and there's a lot of economic depression and all those kind of things anyway but skegness has got that kind of cheeky postcard thing going on anyway they they they're proud of it really um and there's a scene in the book that i've got with a you know a boat ride they've got like a boating lake in skegness and again, my 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 location is very loosely based on that. I've seen that there is a boating lake. I've not actually been on it, but I've I've seen it and I've kind of seen the things. And I just kind of took it, turned it up to eleven. You know, everything's really, really over the top. You know, plastic uh, police cruisers and things like this going around this little um, boating lake. But they have got those kind of things in Skegness. That's what makes it so. It's fun. It's kind of a fun place to go for a weekend or to go on a stag or a hen or something like that. Um, but the mood that my main character is in when he first gets, when he arrives there is, it's not really up for any of that stuff, really. You've been asked about interest in it for TV. Uh, I haven't. I've had a couple of people say that they think it would make an interesting thing, and, and I and I have been working on again in the background. See, I've got a lot of other stuff to do, but in the background, I'm kind of working on a pilot idea for it. Um, I've had a couple of people compare it to. I don't know whether you remember the BBC show Hustle. Do you remember that many years ago? No, I'm not the person to ask though, because I don't really watch TV. You read books, obviously. That's yeah, good. I do exactly you've not got time to watch telly well bbc yeah the bbc was they had a program called hustle it was um by the same person that wrote life on mars uh which again you might may or may not remember but that was that was another crime thing that came later on but hustle was kind of about a, a bunch of con um con men and con women and each week they would do like a different little heist and a little kind of hustle and somebody compared it to that so i've had a couple of people say that so i i mean i think it'd be I mean, obviously, I'm biased, but yeah, I think it'd be well suited to TV. So there's an interesting cast of characters. I think Mickey's an interesting uh, character, and I think his safe cracking skill would be interesting to show um, on TV um, to kind of lean into. So yeah, that's something that I would, um, as I say, I, I kind of got a bit of a, a, a pilot that I'm kind of writing that I'm chipping away at um, when I get time, basically. You tempted to write outside the crime genre at all? Yes, I've got another book that's. I've got a really, really messy first draft of a book that's in a totally different genre. That's in, I guess you'd call it, um, kind of like urban fantasy, called um, "Let Sleeping Gods Lie," uh, which again is kind of it's, it's comedy. It's a bit like Douglas Adams' kind of uh, Terry Pratchett, I guess. Not Terry Pratchett is in fantasy type world but um that sort of dry humor and a little bit silly with some serious overtones so i'd like to do that but i think the difficulty is you know a lot of writers will tell you that kind of what you start off in and kind of what you become known for is ca it can be difficult to 
to break out of that sometimes. Some writers have done it. Uh, you know, famously, Stephen King can basically write whatever he wants, but that's because he's Stephen King. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, some people use pen names, though, don't they? Do a different genre. Yeah, they do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, which was which is another reason that I I, I chose uh, W. A. Kelly when I when I published this was but that was one of the reasons just because I thought well it gives me another you know another way to go down the line if I do decide to publish that book or something that's slightly different um, slightly, slightly different with it to do that so I might there do that needs to be more quality urban fantasy in the world so I'd encourage you to do it. Well, if you want to be a beta reader when I do the next draft, then I'll, you know, by all means. Uh, yeah, it's, 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 uh, I mean, I loved writing that book, but again, I wrote it a while ago and I should imagine if I read it now, it'd be incredibly embarrassing. It, it needs some work, but the story is, it is, I think, it's definitely got legs and it's interesting. Um, yep. And there's, there's a bit of comedy in it as well, so, which I like. Possibly my very favourite of genres. Oh, right. Mm. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. Love it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I do. I mean, I don't know why. I, I mean, I couldn't tell you why I started writing that book specifically. It was just, I just got a very, very specific idea. And I was reading a lot. I mean, that is another one of my favourite authors, actually. Now you come to mention it. Douglas Adams is one of my favourite authors. Um, I love his Dirk Gently books, which I guess class as crime. So I could probably bring those up as well anyway. But uh, the Holistic Detective Agency and things like that. Um, Oh, brilliant so i was reading a lot of that at the time so that probably influenced it um but uh yeah i might go back to that but at the minute it's kind of uh page hopefully page turning thrillers is the the thing that i'm, I'm going for at the minute Fair play. <laughs> they go together don't they um what have you read recently that you've enjoyed your book for the year so far well, uh, Joe Country was the last book that I read, which was Mick Heron again, which was uh, the Slow Horses um, thing. Um, I've also read uh, All the Sinners Bleed, S.A. Cosby, which was really good. I don't know whether you've read that or whether you've read any any of his books. I haven't yet. He's really good. My favourite S.A. Cosby book is uh, Black Top Wasteland, which is his first book. I really recommend that if you like sort of American noir kind of fiction, but it's kind of modern and it's it's good. I think my favourite American crime author is Joe Lansdale. Right, you haven't read any of his stuff or her stuff. Is it his, him or her? Uh, uh, him. Him. Legend. You need to. Oh, right, yeah. The TV series as well, of his series. Right, oh, I'll have to check that out. And again, I think it's like, I mean, with S.A. Cosby, again, he writes, so far anyway, I mean, he's, he's, All the Sinners Bleed is basically, a, it's kind of a police procedural, but the books, the two books before that, both books have got uh, a criminal protagonist, you know, or somebody that's trying to escape a criminal past, essentially. So I just think I'm, for whatever reason, I'm drawn to those kind of characters, um, you know, that's why I like things, TV programs like Ozark and things like that. It's the same sort of thing. I like these normal people that are drawn into these dark worlds. That's what I was trying to do with Safe Hands. Um, that was kind of the story that I was trying to tell there. So S.A. Cosby, McCarran, any other good reads? Uh, well, I'm going really old school at the minute. The book that I'm actually reading right now is Shogun uh james clavell but i think it's because the tv program's on so i thought i'd give the book a read before i go dive into the new tv adaptation have you read that i have read one of his books i don't know if it was shogun yeah because there's definitely a dip into... yeah it's good actually i wasn't sure whether i'd like it but it's good it's very it's not the kind of thing i would usually read but it's kind of very uh, kind of swashbuckling um at the beginning with all the kind of seafaring stuff and all that but it's good it's really really good writing and it's good i mean i don't know about you but i do like to read i, I read quite a lot of non-fiction as well but i do like to mix it up a little bit with my genres although i mainly read crime i do occasionally like to just you know throw another book in there i'm reading some science fiction as well at the minute uh which is by james s.a corey which is um there's again there's a tv series called the expanse and so that's the books these are the books that the tv series ended up being based on um, the expanse is fabulous. 
yeah well I've, i'm just on the second series of the expanse i've only i'm late to, to the tv show yeah right. yeah so too far into the books either no i'm literally on the first book but i'm really yeah. enjoying it you yeah. are for such a treat and they're bringing out a new series this year oh are they? what a new tv series or, or new or new no, book? new a new book series I saw that yeah oh that'll be great yeah so you've watched all the so so that is the TV program that has sucked you in. Then that one has got yeah, you. Yeah, love the expanse. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah. good. Spice, I think. Right, and do you do? How do you think it compares to the books? Did you prefer the books or the TV the books show? Are definitely better because they're more detailed, and That's they right. the sort of something at the end. So the end of the the no spoilers, but yeah. the end is a bit rushed, and some characters aren't in the end that are in the books they probably run out of money <laughs> for the tv show that i mean that is the bit having worked in production that is the biggest that is the biggest difference i mean i do i do a writing workshop where i talk about this um but one of the big differences between writing books and writing screenplays is with a book you the only thing that you're limited by with your book is your imagination you anything you can think up you can stick it in your book but when it comes to writing a script you are limited by how much money you can spend on it so you know a big car chase suddenly becomes a foot chase you know uh you've got 10 characters well we can only afford five so you need to make some changes so that's 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 the biggest change really between books and films is is uh the budget yeah so you probably find because it looks like an expensive tv series with all the all the special yeah. effects well it started on sci-fi didn't it and then um Jeff Bezos funded the end of it because he was a fan and they'd cancelled it. Oh, right. Is that right? Oh, okay. That makes sense why it's on Amazon Prime then. Yeah. Uh, interestingly, I interviewed Ben Aranovich a while ago and he's done the writing for TV and print and he said some of the reasons that he does crazy things in like Rivers of London is because he can get away with it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's he's exactly. almost like writing them to be hard to film. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Yeah, I mean, they're, they're that's another great writer. They're great books, actually. Yeah, that, that's a really good example, actually, of that genre. Yeah, but that's precisely it. I mean, you can put anything in uh, in a book. You are not, you are only limited by your imagination, and you it soon you, as soon as you actually involved with a production on anything, even a very you know I've made very small sh small budget short films and things. You, you, you suddenly start having to make some very difficult decisions. It's, it's a bit easier if you've written the script because you can kind of come to terms with a compromise. But if somebody else is telling you it, then it's a bit more difficult to to accept, really. But it's a lot of the, a lot of people don't realise it's the same. A lot of people complain about historical fiction when it's done on TV because they'll often say, "Oh, in real life there was this character and there was that character and there was this character and the." The, the director or the producer, whoever, when they've budgeted it, it's, it's, it's not just that. There's also story reasons. You can usually combine sort of three characters into one for a story reason, but it does help with a budget as well. So that's something to bear in mind. So yeah. next time we're slagging off TV adaptations, just bear that in mind. Just try to see the other side of it. <laughs> yeah, well, let's see we're all learning today from talking to you. Hopefully. <laughs> Even it's about TV adaptations. Haven't you been out to like film festivals and things with your documentaries? Yeah, have yeah. So we've been lucky enough to go over to LA uh, for uh, with the short film that we made. Went out to which was great, which was great fun. It wasn't quite the Oscars, but it was it was good fun getting out there and uh, you know meeting people from different parts of the world. And then you yeah, had a feature length documentary um called no fair the sean green story which has been on um did, did a limited cinema run and different bits and pieces um which was good fun and again all that kind of feeds into my writing it is is the thing meeting all these different characters telling all these different stories through documentary and the other stuff that i do um branded content and whatever it is like everybody else i mean anybody else that writes most writers unless you're best selling uh, you know, incredibly successful best-selling author that's started shifting millions of books. Most writers have got other jobs or some other kind of income, but it all kind of feeds into to what we write. The same as any, the same as anything else, really. Uh, it's all it's all life experience. 
but some of those experiences I would imagine like with yours um they're probably more helpful than others if you know what I mean I feel like sort of writing you know what you're doing and filming and doing things like that really helps with writing yeah I mean I think one of the big things really is uh, um, and like I say, this is, I mean, I've got a workshop that's coming up that I'm doing in Leicester in, uh, in May that's kind of on this. It's to help people write better books and better stories, but kind of using this this mindset, the screenwriting mindset. And it's thinking about, because part of it is budget, but also part of it nowadays, if you watch TV, modern TV, people just, they haven't got any patience. I mean, it's true to a certain extent of books as well. Books have changed, I think, over the last, you know, sort of 20 to 30 years. People, you're competing now with Netflix and all this other stuff, even to, to read books. So you kind of have to draw people in. They have to get people quickly. You have to hook them quickly. You have to keep them turning the pages and get them interested and invested in your characters. And you really can't have a wasted scene or chapter. You can't just put a scene in there because you want to describe some nice countryside or you want to put lots and lots of you know pages and pages and pages of description where which is fine i love description and i love great writing it's not that but it kind of has to be doing something else as well it kind of has to be pushing the story on or telling us something else about the character or giving us some some kind of hints about the plot further down the line or whatever um you kind of just have a have to have a mind on that and think about as I say, what's the A to B of the scene and pushing things forward. So I think it helps from that point of view and just trying to, you know, almost thinking like of it as each, each chapter of your book is almost like an episode from your favorite box set. It's there's so many box sets on TV now, not that you'd know Kaz cause you don't watch that much TV, but if you what you've always the expanse got, yeah. But you know yourself, if you get to the end of a TV program, I should imagine even more so for somebody like you, if you don't watch loads of TV, the TV that you do watch has got to really grab you and hold hold on to you. So when you get to the end of that first episode, the pilot episode or whatever, there's got to be something that makes you really, really want to watch the next episode. And I think as writers, now we kind of have to think exactly the same thing when we write our books. You need to be thinking about what, what's the reason that the person's going to turn the page to read chapter two and then chapter three and then chapter four and on and on it goes. Because I think half the time there's so many distractions, there's so many other books out there and all these kind of things. You know, if the, if someone's only half invested in your characters and your story, then they'll just put the book down and they'll do something else or they'll read another book or they'll watch another TV programme or whatever, one of the other many distractions that we've got. So um, that's what we can kind of compete in with. And I think that's kind of what I'm trying to do with my writing is trying to make it as compelling as possible. That's the idea behind it. So when you get kind of, you know, when you do get a nice message from somebody saying, oh, you know, I wasn't sure whether I liked this character, I really liked it, and I actually read it in two days, or, uh, you know, somebody told me that they they read it while they were on Christmas Day, while they were cooking a Christmas dinner, and they didn't talk to the husband for two hours and didn't realise they were reading the book and stuff like that. I mean, it's bad for their marriage, but it's good It's good for my, um, my ego. <laughs> um, you've got two minutes left. So okay. sum up what people are going to go away and buy. Remind people about your your novel. So, yeah, so uh, Safe Hands, whether you can see it there. So Safe Hands, it's, as I said before, it's hopefully it's it's page turning, it's compelling, it's a thriller. It's just come out in audio book as well, um, literally in the last couple of weeks. And I don't know whether to tell you or not, because it might put you off, but it also might work the other way. I actually narrate the book, which was a bit of a challenge that we didn't get into. But um, again, I've had some nice reviews of that. I've not been obviously not done too bad a job, hopefully. Um, but that was good fun doing lots of different voices and things. Um, there's another book that's on its way uh, later on in the year. And if you go to my website at waynekellywrites.com, you can and sign up to my newsletter. You get a free um, a free ebook with two crime stories in it as well. And there's some videos on the website, and you can watch a short. There's a short horror film on there. You can see that I wrote and lots of other stuff. So that's WayneKellyWrites.com. And uh, if you buy the book, if you read the book, if you listen to the book, whatever, I'd love to hear what you think about it. Um, I'd love to hear from you. Just drop me a line or jump onto the website. That'd be brilliant. Thanks. Fabulous. And, and thanks then, for you, Kaz. I really appreciate it. I am more than welcome. You can come back anytime. That's great. Great to talk to you. And I'll let you know how I get on with the rest of the expanse. Yeah, do. 